What is going on, fellow dentists? Dr. B here from the Comprehensive of Dentists. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a topic that has not really been discussed on this channel yet, and that is dental sleep medicine. Over the past few years, I have taken a few short courses on this topic and have sat in on many lectures. Currently, I help teach dental sleep medicine to our one-year AGD residents in Georgia. And throughout the year, we actually treat quite a few patients with sleep apnea using oral appliances. I think the topic of sleep apnea is something that every dentist should be aware of and should understand. You really need to know how to screen for sleep apnea as part of the dental examination. So in this video, we will look at a simple way to screen patients for sleep apnea. I will give you access to a screening cheat sheet and a screening form that you can use in your dental practice. Let's get started. Sleep apnea is very prominent and something we should look for as part of our dental examination. There's so many things that we see daily within our patients that have been linked to dental sleep apnea or represent signs of possible sleep apnea. One of the most common things that we see that has been linked to sleep apnea is tooth wear from grinding or bruxism as the etiology. We will talk more about that shortly, but my point is there are a lot of signs and symptoms that we should be clued into. Sleep apnea represents a sleep-related breathing disorder. Sleep-related breathing disorders are within a spectrum, meaning there are less severe forms at one end of the spectrum and more severe forms at the other end of the spectrum. Mild snoring would be considered a mild breathing disorder, and more complex types of breathing disorders are heavy snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome, and various severities of obstructive sleep apnea. Snoring is due to the vibration of the soft tissue of the upper airway during inspiration. With obstructive sleep apnea, you will see snoring, but is also characterized by apneas, or periods when a person stops breathing for a minimum of 10 seconds or longer. A patient with sleep apnea could also have hypopneas, or periods of decreased ventilation where there is 30 to 50% reduction in airflow. So with apnea, you have no breathing, and with hypopnea, you have breathing, but it's not good breathing. With hypopneas, the patient is essentially getting less oxygen than is ideal. Sleep apnea is classified using the apnea hypopnea index or AHI. This is an average number of apneas plus hypopneas per hour of sleep. The traditional way this is determined is in a sleep lab during a sleep study. So if a person has an AHI of less than five events per hour, they are considered normal. Despite being labeled as normal, keep in mind that if they have less than five but still have an event or two, they are still not breathing for at least 10 seconds or they have a reduced uh, amount of breathing. How well do you think you would sleep if you did that a few times an hour even though a test says you're normal? Exactly, you would likely not sleep well at all. So even though less than five is normal, consider the implications of normal in that context I described. If you have an AHI of five to 15 events per hour, this is regarded as mild sleep apnea. 16 to 30 events per hour are moderate and greater than 30 events per hour is severe. It's suspected that a large contributor to sleep apnea is the relaxing of soft tissues and muscles surrounding the airway, including the soft palate and the tongue. As these tissues relax, the airway constricts and makes it harder to breathe. Sleep apnea is a medical disorder and it can be life-threatening if left untreated. Studies have shown an increased mortality rate with untreated sleep apnea for all severities of sleep apnea, but especially for moderate and severe forms. A dentist cannot diagnose sleep apnea legally, but we can screen for it. You can screen and refer patients for evaluation by a sleep doctor who will decide if a sleep study is necessary. And if you are trained, you can even provide oral appliances to patients as part of their therapy, so long as the patient is prescribed an oral appliance uh, from their sleep doctor. You would of course need to take additional training to learn about the variety of sleep appliances and all the ins and outs of sleep apnea that will relate to treating these patients. Uh, the details of treating sleep apnea with oral appliance therapy uh, is certainly more information than we will cover today in this video. Screening for sleep apnea starts as soon as the patient walks into the office. It continues throughout the examination. 
I personally like to use a sleep screening questionnaire to help me screen my patients. In a perfect world, every patient that walks in the door would fill this out and the form would be reviewed looking for potential risk factors or indications for possible sleep apnea. The screening form helps keep me honest and ensures I don't accidentally forget something. It is also thorough enough that I can decide if I want to refer my patients to a sleep doctor or dismiss the patient and rescreen at a later date. Ideally, you would rescreen every patient in your practice at every periodic evaluation. You can download this screening tool by following the link in the description. This form is the form we use in our residency and it was adapted from Dr. Jameson Spencer, a world-renowned expert in dental sleep medicine. If you want to take a fantastic course in dental sleep medicine and the treatment of TMD, you really should check out his course called Spencer Study Club for more information. So you will notice that the form starts with the Epworth Sleepiness Scale Questionnaire. This scale presents the patient with a series of situations and asks them to rank on a zero to three scale how likely they would doze or fall asleep during those situations. Zero being that they would never doze and three being that they have a high chance of dozing. This is subjective, but it does a decent job of getting you some information to start. Unfortunately, there's not a significant correlation between falling asleep and sleep apnea. But when you refer a patient to the sleep doctor, they will use this scale and many insurance companies want this information as well for future treatment purposes. If a patient has a higher number on the sleepiness scale, it could indicate excessive daytime tiredness, which is a risk factor and symptom of sleep apnea. The next part of the form asks the patient if they have ever been diagnosed with a variety of conditions and asks them if they are aware of any presented signs or symptoms. You will want to review this form with the patient and use this information to determine if a referral to a sleep doctor is appropriate. Knowing if the patient has ever been diagnosed with depression, insomnia, or previously diagnosed with sleep apnea is essential. These are all potential signs of a problem. Untreated sleep apnea can lead to cardiovascular issues such as hypertension, heart disease, and stroke. Asking about these conditions could clue you into a bigger problem. TMJ pain has long been associated with nighttime bruxism, which is also associated with sleep apnea. Last, gastric reflux has also been linked to sleep apnea and is something you should ask about. One prominent symptom of sleep apnea is excessive daytime sleepiness. If the patient feels tired or fatigued all the time, that could indicate a problem. Snoring is also associated with sleep apnea and is a mild breathing sleep disorder. Grinding of the teeth, waking up at night frequently, or experiencing frequent headaches is a symptom of nighttime bruxism. And this is an important risk indicator for sleep apnea. Patients who are overweight or possibly obese are potential candidates for sleep apnea. If you ever ask a patient how much they weigh, you could quickly determine their BMI. BMI or the body mass index is calculated by using the height and weight of the patient. The internet is full of BMI calculators and you could easily do this with the patient's information. A BMI greater than 30 would indicate that the patient is in the obese category and this is considered a risk factor for sleep apnea. It has often been said that a patient who has a neck circumference of greater than 17 inches is also at risk for sleep apnea. Honestly, I don't have or use a tape measure and I don't measure people's necks regularly or even ever for that matter. However, you can just look at some patients and tell if they have a large, thick neck. Having more mass in the neck region can make it more difficult for the patient to breathe when they are sleeping and when all that tissue and muscle relax. Other things in the mouth to look for that have been linked to sleep apnea are high arch palates and dental and skeletal class two patients. Also look out for enlarged tonsils and large uvula and pay close attention to the soft palate. Have the patient stick their tongue out and say, ah, if they have a malampotty score of three or four, this indicates a potentially obstructive oral pharynx, and this could be a risk factor for sleep apnea. What if the patient has anterior wear or scalloping on the lateral border of the tongue? It has long been suggested that nighttime grinding or bruxism was initiated in the central nervous system, specifically the brainstem. You know what else is controlled by the brainstem? Breathing. Here is why bruxism is linked to sleep apnea. Let's say a patient is sleeping and their airway starts to narrow and they develop an apnea. So they stop breathing for 10 seconds or more. Eventually their brain that is being deprived of oxygen will start to panic and the body has to figure out how to get oxygen while the patient is sleeping. What if the brainstem initiates bruxism as a means to move the lower jaw forward, thereby opening the airway? 
If there are several apneas or hypopneas at night, the moving of the jaw would be occurring over and over again, causing potential wear on the teeth with possible strain on the muscles and joints. The scalping of the tongue would be due to the tongue also being pushed forward against the teeth again and again to open the airway. The brainstem initiates this process, makes the muscles move, and then the jaw and teeth shift accordingly. This is why the wear of the teeth and scalping the tongue is a risk factor. It has also been suggested that when teeth are moving as they would during bruxism, there will be pressure on the teeth. With pressure on the teeth, you will either have bone building or bone destruction. Some think that mandibular or maxillary tori represent bone building from repeated bouts of bruxism. In contrast, bone loss or periodontal disease could be linked to this theory as well. This is certainly an interesting hypothesis and something we should look for in our dental exam. At the bottom of the screening form is a section where you can check some of your dental findings that could relate to sleep apnea. In the description below, I have also placed a link to the dental sleep medicine screening cheat sheet. It has a list of things you should look for and lists daytime and nighttime symptoms of sleep apnea. Make sure you review this sheet as part of your discussion with the patient for a more thorough screening. I would strongly recommend you find sleep providers in your area and get to know them and their referral process. In some cases, you may have to refer patients through their primary care provider or family physician. If I'm not sure who the sleep doctor is or how to go through them, I will depend on the patient instead meaning I will explain to the patient my findings and attempt to impress on them the concerns that I have. I will then ask them to follow up with their primary care to discuss my findings and the possibility of a sleep study referral. And then I put a good note in the patient's chart about my findings and my recommendations for the referral. Hopefully, the patient goes and follows through with their primary care, but I always plan to write my notes in a way that I will be reminded when the patient comes back to recheck these things. This way, I remember to ask the patients about what they did with my recommendations. Make sure you track the patients that you refer. Ideally, you will have some sort of referral form or consultation form to send as well. Remember that when you do refer to a physician, you are requesting consideration for the patient to have a sleep study. We are not telling the physician they have to do a sleep study. We simply state our findings and list our concerns. So. Dental sleep medicine is a huge topic and we didn't even scratch the surface in this video. I hope that this has at least piqued your interest and perhaps you will find the screening tool and the cheat sheet beneficial in your dental practice. Remember, we are not just dentists, but we are medical providers. You can drill and fill teeth all day long and that will make a good living. But if you wanna be a fantastic provider, you need to think more comprehensively and use all the information you can to best treat your patients. If you like this video, please hit the like button. If you have not subscribed, please do so now. Let me know if you enjoyed this content in the comments section and let me know if you have any questions. If you like this content, there is so much more we can talk about and dive into in future videos. I wanna thank you for watching The Comprehensive Dentist and I will see you next time.